Good morning and welcome to our Harvest Sunday morning service. I don't suppose many of you have been out in your field ploughing this morning before breakfast or actually doing any harvesting. But quite a few people I'm sure have got gardens where they may grow a few vegetables or fruit. And I know that most of us have got enough to eat every day and we're very blessed in that. So this morning we're going to thank God for every blessing that we receive and all the food that we get and the people who are involved in the provision of it. So let's sing together in praise to God. All good gifts around us are sent from heaven above. Oh, 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 oh,
Racing and Company for reminding us of the great King of Heaven is interested in every one of us. Later on, we'll hear the story that Jesus told us about the Kingdom of Heaven. Back in May, Pentecost Sunday, we shared the Lord's Prayer with several people praying at the same time in different languages. Lots of us found it very moving to experience. So we are going to invite you to share that again today. The Lord's Prayer includes a simple request to God to give us our daily bread. And the prayer starts with our desire to see God's kingdom as a reality on earth right now. Amen. As I choose to fix my eyes on you, there is nothing I would rather do than worship, worship. As I think about what you have done, how you sent your one and only son, I'm grateful, grateful.
Good morning. Heather asked me to speak about my spiritual gift. Spiritual gifts are the unique skills and abilities given by the Holy Spirit to faithful followers of Christ to serve God for the common benefit of his people and his church. There is a spiritual gift survey devised by the church that you can complete which will show you your particular gift. I have done several surveys over the years, the first probably about 30 years ago, and the most recent, actually 48 hours ago. The results were almost exactly the same. My dominant gift is hospitality, or sometimes known as serving. I remember being somewhat disappointed after the initial survey. Tea making, I thought. Tea making? Is that all I can do? I wanted wisdom or teaching or prophecy. Even yesterday, I rather hoped that speaking in tongues might pop up, but it didn't. I had answered the survey as honestly as I could, and my dominant gift is hospitality. But as I did years ago, I was encouraged as I read on and the explanation was given. The gift of hospitality or serving is not the gift that God gives you when you can't do anything else. It is spiritual in nature and as important as any gift in the church. Never think it is anything less. It only becomes less if you do not use it as God intended. Your love for the Lord shows every time the doors of the church are opened and especially if it was you that oiled the hinges so they don't squeak. So I've come to realise that it is a vital service. We're not all called upon to be preachers. And building an effective team in our church depends on having the right people doing the right job at the right time. Whatever that might be. I'm certainly not alone in bringing this gift to Liverpool Walton because there are very many people who can turn their practical skills and serving nature into relevant and essential work within our church. Just think of the many breakfasts, lunches, buffets, suppers that we've all enjoyed and we will do it again. We know how to eat well at Walton. Beautiful food. Beautifully prepared, cooked and organised by those who are using their gifts for us all. Just look around our centre both inside and out and again you will see the labours of love willingly undertaken by those who care about our building and want to see it attractive, tidy and accessible for everybody. I seem to have been involved with catering in one form or another for many years from uh, Sunday school holidays for 50, 50 or 60 children and adults, which involves three days of picnics, sausage and chips, um, to welcome meals for visiting sections. And so uh, preparing a roast dinner for 60 or 70 people really doesn't faze me at all. It's just a matter of organisation, timing, and lists, endless lists. It's a doddle. And it does help if you choose vegetables that don't go soggy. My gift of serving often manifests itself in other ways. For example, putting together a display that celebrates God's provision and faithfulness at harvest time. Or setting up a focal point on Remembrance Sunday, which helps us to think about those who fought for our freedom and peace. Assembling such displays and arrangements never fails to move me, and I always pray that they will be helpful and relevant in our worship. If you attend our core, you will know that for the last few years, I've been privileged to take the wooden cross that we use on Good Friday meetings and make it into something beautiful for our Easter Sunday celebration. By covering it with flowers. It takes me many hours and a huge amount of flowers and foliage to transform it 
but it is an absolute joy to do. After the meeting, it is usually taken into the garden outside and there it stays to remind the local community of the risen Saviour. It's a great witness and lots of people look out for it every year now. Because of the pandemic this year, I was unable to get across to do it. But I felt it especially important to still have the cross there. And so I was very grateful to Glyn Samuel, who took up the task and did a fantastic job of decorating the cross. It was absolutely beautiful. And we were still able to make that statement that Jesus is alive and so is this church. I may well have to fight him next year for the job. He did it uh, <clears throat> too well. Christmas also brings opportunities for me to use my gifts, as I, with many helpers, both willing and coerced, make our worship hall and other areas in our centre attractive and welcoming and worthy of celebrating this lovely season. We put up seven trees, lots of garlands, dozens of suspended stars from the roof beams, thousands of lights and very tasteful decorations. But do not mess with my colour schemes. It's purple in the main hall because that matches the chairs. It's dusky pink in the lounge because that matches the curtains. It's red in the YP hall. It's silver in the foyer and it's fuchsia pink in the hub because that matches the coffee shop logo. We don't have tinsel. We don't have glitter. We don't have tack. Do not upset me with the Christmas decorations. Just saying. Seriously. If all the catering, displays and arrangements that I do help to create an environment within our church which is friendly, welcoming and conducive to worship for everyone who uses the building, then I am using my gifts for his kingdom to honour God and to bring others into a knowledge of his love. So I'll take my gift of hospitality and serving and use it to the best of my ability for the very best of reasons. In Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2, it says this, Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unaware. Well, when I get to heaven, I might meet those angels, but I really hope that the first thing they don't say to me is, Margaret, there's some flowers over there that need arrangement. Oh, and by the way, we've got a lunch for 5,000 today. Could you just sort that out? What? I don't think so. Maybe. God bless everybody. I'll see you soon. Hello. For today's story, there are some actions, and Ben is going to show you what to do. When I say Bernard, rub your fingers together like this. When I say work, wipe your brow like this. When I say o'clock, use your arms like a clock and say tick tock like this. Tick tock, tick tock. When I say pay, rub your hands together like this. Good. Now you're ready, we can begin. Jesus told people a story. This is Bernard. Bernard is a rich landowner. He went out early to the market to find people to work on his farm. Bernard arrived at the market at six o'clock and found some workers. He agreed to give them fair pay and took them to his farm to begin working. Later on, at nine o'clock, Bernard went back to the market and saw some more people looking for work. He hired them and took them to his farm. Again at twelve o'clock and three o'clock, Bernard went to the market and found more people to work 
on his farm. At five o'clock, Bernard went to the market one last time and still found more people to work. He asked them, why haven't you been out to work today? No one hired us, they replied. Then come with me and you can work. On my farm, said Bernard. At the end of the day, Bernard called everyone over to receive their pay. First came the people he hired late in the afternoon. Bernard gave each one a full day's pay. The people who had worked since six o'clock in the morning thought this was great. If the latecomers get a full day's pay, surely we must get even more, they thought. When Bernard came to pay them, he gave them each the same amount as the people who had only worked in the evening. They only worked one hour and you gave them the same amount of money as us. But we've been here all day, they complained. Bernard replied, didn't you agree to work today for this pay? Then take your money and go. I can choose to spend my money how I want to. You shouldn't be jealous because I'm kind to others. Jesus used this story to demonstrate that everyone who is his follower is part of his kingdom and can be with him forever. It doesn't matter when they choose to follow him or what they did in the past. So, like the people in the story who were still able to follow Bernard to his field and work for the same pay, we all still have the same chance to decide to follow Jesus and be a part of his kingdom. I've chosen to follow Jesus and I hope that you choose to follow him too. If you search the Bible for teaching on giving, you will find plenty of references to tithing, offering a tenth of something to God. But you might not know that in Deuteronomy chapter 14, there is an instruction to enjoy some of the tithe for feasting. Now when the Lord your God blesses you with a good harvest, the place of worship he chooses for his name to be honoured might be too far for you to bring the tithe. If so, you may sell the tithe portion. When you arrive, you may use the money to buy any kind of food you want, wine or other alcoholic drink, then feast there in the presence of the Lord your God and celebrate with your household. Apart from the bit about wine, enjoying a feast or even a cup of tea and a donut is something we love to do at Walton. As we can't share a meal together this harvest, we're going to look back on some of the other times we've feasted together, accompanied by the band with a piece of music that reflects a little of what it means to be part of God's kingdom.
that song for this morning because it fits so well with the idea of building the kingdom of God and as I listened to it this week the news was coming out about the increase of the COVID cases in the UK and the additional restrictions particularly here in Merseyside and there was one line that stuck out for me as I listened it was the it was the plea really um, to heal our streets and lands and that is something that we long for so much at the moment in respect of the virus, uh, the anxiety that that causes and all the other negative things that we can sometimes feel overwhelmed with as we are going through this time. So I thought it would be good now to pause and just pray about that. Keep us, good Lord, under the shadow of your mercy in this time of uncertainty and distress. Sustain and support the anxious and fearful, and lift up all who are brought low, that we may rejoice in your comfort, knowing that nothing can separate us from your love. In Christ Jesus our Lord. Lord. 
Lord Jesus Christ, you taught us to love our neighbour and to care for those in need, as if we were caring for you. In this time of anxiety, give us strength to comfort the fearful, to tend the sick and to assure the isolated of our love and your love. For your name's sake. Amen. Thank you, Kevin. Now, if you're familiar with army or church culture, you've probably come across the idea of an altar service before. And at harvest time, we usually take an envelope, maybe something like this, and place it on the holiness table or the altar table, perhaps on top of an open Bible. It's usually considered a sacred moment, and so it's treated with appropriate reverence. But I know that in other cultures, the time of offering is often considered to be a really joyful time, um, accompanied with music, maybe even with dancing, as people will approach the altar with their gifts. And so I wanted to encourage us to think about that today and perhaps do our online altar service a little bit differently. Listen to this uh, verse taken from Corinthians chapter two. It says, remember this, a farmer who plants only a few seeds will get a small crop, but the one who plants generously will get a generous crop. You must each decide in your heart how much to give and don't give reluctantly or in response to pressure. For God loves a person who gives cheerfully and God will generously provide all you need. Then you will always have everything you need and plenty left over to share with others. So we're going to have a cheerful time now as we have our online altar service. We're going to enjoy our junior band playing happy all the time. We'll see pictures of folks enjoying fruit and vegetables that they have grown in their garden or food that they've made, along with some images of how an altar service at home might look. And then Graham is going to pray with us. <laughs> I would like to say a thank you to you all for your harvest offerings. 
I'd also like to say a very big thank you for your continuing and ongoing regular support of the Corps during these weeks and months. It is not taken for granted and very much appreciated. Thank you. We've brought our offerings today. Now I would like to pray and I'd like to place them before the Lord, just as you have done, and say thank you for these gifts. Let's pray. Father God, you have blessed us so much and in presenting these gifts to you, we want to acknowledge your goodness to each one of us. Bless these offerings. Use them in your service here in this particular place as we seek to understand and do your will and purposes in this place. Bless these gifts, Lord. Amen. see if we can gather all the elements of our meeting together. We've worshipped with music focused on God's goodness and the Kingdom of Heaven. We've heard Margaret share her passion for hospitality and some of the practical ways she invites people to share the Kingdom. We've remembered some of the great feasts we've had together and how most of us are blessed with plenty to eat and how some of us enjoy growing or making our own food. And we've seen Ben and Dan retelling a story about workers on the farm. Now, if you've heard that story before, or if you've got your Bible to hand, you'll see that the original version from Matthew chapter 20 is actually about a vineyard and not a farm. 
Unfortunately, our Playmobil crew don't have vines or grapes, but the key points are the same. And for today, that's the important thing. Now, this is one of several stories that Jesus starts by saying, the kingdom of heaven is like. And it's probably worth saying that in the book of Matthew, we have this term, the kingdom of heaven, several times. Other writers like Luke more often refer to the kingdom of God. But Matthew was writing to a mainly Jewish audience who would have been uncomfortable using the name of God. So to communicate on their terms, he uses the phrase kingdom of heaven, but they mean the same thing. And you might notice that it's the same in the Lord's Prayer, which also comes from the book of Matthew. We speak to our Father in heaven and we pray, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. What we're doing is we're asking God to change the world that we live in here and now so that, that it functions in the way that he would want it to. And this story told by Jesus helps us understand what it might be like if we all followed God's way of doing things in his kingdom. So it's about a wealthy landowner, Bernard, who chooses to be generous to people that we might think are undeserving of that generosity. It includes some casual labourers, some who worked a 12 hour shift, some who worked a bit less and a few that worked for only an hour. And each of them were paid the going rate for a day's work. Now, it turns out that the workers who started earliest were outraged that the latecomers received the same pay that they did. I sort of get where they were coming from, do you? I can imagine their indignation. We've probably all been in situations where we feel aggrieved because we, or maybe somebody we care about, has been treated unfairly. And be honest, we can sometimes be irritated over the slightest of issues. Like when you're in the supermarket and they open another till and the guy behind you nips in quick before you've had a chance to move that trolley with the wonky wheel. So you stay stuck in the queue with the trainee who's just broken the till. But sometimes we face unfairness about really serious matters. Maybe at work or school, when well, someone gets away with some really bad behaviour that we know hurts other people, or they lie and take credit for the hard work that someone else has done. But that's not what's going on here. The late arrivals have done nothing wrong. They haven't cheated or caused any unfairness. But the others still have strong feelings against them. So the landowner says to them, Is it against the law for me to do what I want with my money? Should you be jealous because I'm kind to others? The early starters haven't lost anything. They have received exactly what they were promised, a fair day's pay. They protest, not because they don't have what they've earned, but because others have more than they think they deserve. Had they been paid first and just gone away, they would have been happy. The thing that caused that unhappiness was the good fortune of others. So while I can relate to their indignation, actually, I don't want to be like them. I don't want to be mean spirited and resent the good fortune of others. I don't, but if I'm honest, sometimes it's hard not to, isn't it? Maybe it helps how we think about the late arrivals if we understand that the landowner was not just being kind, but he was probably being fair too. All the workers would have been casual labourers on zero hours contracts. The daily rate of pay was probably what we'd think of as a minimum wage, but there was no welfare or universal credit back then to make up what they needed to live on. If no one hired them or only gave them a little work, they probably wouldn't have what they needed to provide for their families. So the landowners was not paying the latecomers what they earned, but what they needed to live on. And the landowner wasn't just a generous employer. Now, these stories sometimes have details that can be overlooked or easily forgotten. I found it interesting that the landowner only asks a question to the very last group when he walks through the market. One question, one answer, and then he told them to go and join the others. Don't you wish all job interviews were that easy? 
This is what he says to them. Why have you been standing here all day long doing nothing? There's a negative or critical tone that comes out of that. And checking back in the reference books, I see that there is an implied suggestion of laziness on their part. Were they work shy, preferring to just hang around the market all day and chat? But they give him a simple answer. And this is what it is. Because no one hired us. I've always taken that answer at face value, but as I prepared today, I've wondered what that answer tells us. You see, every detail in the story is there for a reason. Jesus made the story up so he could include anything that he wanted. This story could have had the same ending without this question being there. So at that point in the story, the landowner has taken on another characteristic of Jesus. He's shown his interest in the workers and he has become the person who's asked the question and allowed them to speak for themselves and to say that nobody had hired them. It wasn't that they were lazy. But I do wonder why no one hired them. Maybe these were the workers no one wanted. I always picked last, either because they belonged to the wrong group or maybe they were actually less capable. There's nothing in the story that tells us either way. But the landowner could have decided to not take them on, just like the other employers. If they're not good enough for everybody else, I certainly don't want them. So here they are, the workers that no one wants, being given a huge bonus, a day's pay for an hour's work. And maybe that's part of the indignation from others. Their place of privilege, being hired first and paid the most, was being undermined in their eyes, by people that were rejected by everybody else. We could spend longer on this story, digging into each of the characters that we find. There is a foreman and I've not even mentioned him, but we really need to move on and think about the impact of the story and how it affects each one of us. To help us do that, we're going to hear from Mary as she ministers with a really beautiful song. Some of you might know it already. It has a rather unusual title. It's called Similitudes. It's a song that combines many of the images that Jesus drew on as he described the kingdom of heaven. And we're also going to see some art from Nell as he brings his insight into the message from the song. Kingdom of heaven is like a seed, a tiny mustard seed, but you know it grows into a great mighty tree. The birds from all over can nest in its leaves. The kingdom of heaven is like the yeast, a tiny bit of it is enough to make the flower rise into bread. So be the leaven of heaven, he said. The kingdom of heaven is like a soul who goes out to sow. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure buried in a field. The kingdom of heaven is like many things. Lord, let your kingdom begin with me. The kingdom of heaven is like a net, a fish net to catch. For the fish is haul it in when it's time to quit. You take in the good and throw back the unfit. The kingdom of heaven is like a pearl. A tiny pearl can be worth a million. Some would mortgage their house and home. The beauty of singular treasure to own. The kingdom of heaven is like a soul who goes out to sow. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure buried in her feet. The kingdom of heaven is like many things. Lord, let your kingdom begin. Lord, let your kingdom begin. Lord, let your kingdom begin.
Let your kingdom begin with me. So at that point in the story, the landowner has taken on another characteristic of Jesus. He's shown his interest in the workers and he has become the person who's asked the question and allowed them to speak for themselves and to say that nobody had hired them. It wasn't that they were lazy. But I do wonder why no one hired them. Maybe these were the workers no one wanted. Always picked last, either because they belonged to the wrong group or maybe they were actually less capable. There's nothing in the story that tells us either way. But the landowner could have decided to not take them on, just like the other employers. If they're not good enough for everybody else, I certainly don't want them. So here they are, the workers that no one wants, being given a huge bonus, a day's pay for an hour's work. And maybe that's part of the indignation from others. Their place of privilege, being hired first and paid the most, was being undermined in their eyes by people that were rejected by everybody else. We could spend longer on this story digging into each of the characters that we find. There is a foreman and I've not even mentioned him. But we really need to move on and think about the impact of the story and how it affects each one of us. To help us do that, we're going to hear from Mary as she ministers with a really beautiful song. Some of you might know it already. It has a rather unusual title. It's called Similitudes. It's a song that combines many of the images that Jesus drew on as he described the kingdom of heaven. And we're also going to see some art from Nell as he brings his insight into the message from the song. Then there's the song. And that's the point, isn't it? We can pray your kingdom come, your will be done. But unless we're willing for the kingdom to begin in each of us, it could just be an empty prayer. So what does that mean in practice as we look back on the story? Maybe it means we have to be more generous, like the landowner. Remember the verses I shared earlier from the second book of Corinthians. For God loves a person who gives cheerfully and God will generously provide all you need. Then you will always have everything you need and plenty left over to share with others. But generosity isn't just about money. It can be how we spend our time and the attention that we give to other people. Perhaps we need to learn to be the person who asks a question and then listens without judgment as people tell their own story. But before we can do any of that, maybe we have to be honest with ourselves about resentment that we sometimes feel about other people. The ones who are not like us, or those who don't seem to be pulling their weight, or the people who are gaining an unearned reward that just doesn't seem fair. If we want to live by kingdom values, we need to fight, but not for what we think we're entitled to, but for those who need it most not fighting against them. But maybe today you relate most to the workers at who but maybe today you relate most to the workers who were hired at the end of the day. Do you feel that you've just joined this great kingdom and you have received more blessings than you could have imagined? Or maybe you feel like the workers before they were hired you can't quite seem to get involved. You feel constantly rejected, not good enough to be chosen, not good enough to be part of the kingdom. But that's not true. You see, the happy ending for this story is that everyone was chosen and those who were normally at the back of the queue were at the front. So let's celebrate that good news as we sing our final song together. And if these words that we're going to sing are not true for you today, then I pray that God will speak them directly to your heart.
And so we come to the conclusion of our worship this morning. Thank you for everyone who's taken part and for you at home as you've listened and shared with us online, wherever that may be. We pray that during these difficult days, you will have been encouraged and blessed and the Lord has spoken to you this morning. In conclusion, I want to bring a prayer that uh, was written a long time ago and is words that I think are very encouragement for us today. This is the God we adore, a faithful, unchangeable friend, whose love is as great as his power and knows neither measure nor end. Tis Jesus, the first and the last, whose spirit shall guide us safe home. We'll praise him for all that is past and we'll trust him for all that's to come. Amen. God bless you.